Good evening, everyone. I will now call this uh, regular work session for the Burnsville City Council to order. Our work sessions are very informal, and we go directly to our agenda. But before we do that, there's a lot of folks in the room, and I think everyone needs to know who's in the room so that uh, they're familiar with uh, the different parties who are here and when we address each of those items. Elizabeth Couts, Mayor of Burnsville. Michelle Collins, City Clerk. Dan Gustafson, City Council. Vince Workman, City Council. Aaron Peterson, Public Works Director. Or Jenny Faulkner, Community Development Director. I'm going to go to you, Melanie. Melanie Mescali, City Manager. Dan Keeley, City Council. Kara Schultz, City Council. And then I'm going to go to the back row. Sean Nelson, City Council. Glenn Markinard, Planning Manager for Bloomington. Julian Winstead, uh, Bloomington Mayor. Welcome colleagues from Bloomington. Gary Johnson, Waste Manager. John McCain, Carlson McCain. Mike Miller, Waste Manager. Uh, Daniel Blair, Waste Manager. Michael Fox, Waste Management. Nancy Burke, Solid Union Waste from Indiana. Jim Barnes, Waste Management. Julie Petrum, Waste Manager. Nick Formal, Carlson McCain. Dave Fowler, Office of Congressman Andrew Greg. John Kilburn, Kramer Minor. Then we'll go with you, Regina. Jack Kellner, Kramer Mine. Chris Anderson, Kramer. Dave Hugh, Hugh Associates. And Peter Larson Larkin Hoffman here with Kramer Mine. Rodney Wisco, Kramer Mine. Blake McGowan, Freeway Transfer. Richard McGowan. Liz Workman, Dakota County. Trish Fisher, Dakota County. Welcome. Tom Gessner, Sunderski. Okay, we'll go to the back one. Mr. Kodoka. Eric Kodoka, uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Hans Navy, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Beth Gowries, Minnesota Pollution Control. Kathy Safer, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Jen Bethridge, Burnsville City Engineer. John Schmeling, Burnsville Assistant City Engineer. Ed Garrett, Burnsville City Planner. Senator? Senator Jim Carlson, the Senate District 51. Pat Hansen, Minnesota Pollution Control. Mark Rust, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Steve Giddings, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Dave Benke, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Welcome, everyone. So we're going to make a little uh, change to our agenda this evening because uh, items two and three are going to be lengthy, I believe. So we're going to uh, start with item number one, which is an update from the Burnhaven Library, and then we'll address item number four, which is a short item, and that's the business banner check-in. So uh, we'll go with... Uh, the Burnsville Library uh, update. Welcome. And um, Mr. Lubers, you are the uh, new director, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Are we good? All right. Um, my name is Chad Lubers, and I am the new um, manager of the Burnsville Library. I just began work this past week, so the weather was spectacular for my first week on the job. <laughs> um, if I want to move into the presentation, just click. Yep. There we go. There. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I um, wanted to stop by today to tell a little bit about where the library's been at this past year, what we've been up to, and also give you a bit of a, a teaser here about what's coming up on the agenda for uh, 2019. Let me just see, because I don't yeah. know if the people on, this, uh, on the sideline can hear. Can you? I don't think the mic's up. Yeah, can it doesn't you, sound like the mic's it up. It doesn't sound like the mic is up. Okay. Um, Took it easy on him. <laughs> yeah, there. Sorry, Mr. Luber, but well, you have a message that I think everybody would like to hear. <laughs> and I think our residents are hearing you, uh, oh, but okay. I don't think the people in the chambers All can right. hear you. So go ahead and continue. All maybe right. outside voice. All right, will do. Thank you. So again, Chad Lubers from uh, Dakota County's Burnsville Library. Uh, just started the, um, in the capacity as library manager this past week. Um, wanted to stop by to talk a little bit about the library's activities recently and then what direction we're heading in for 2019. 
2017, 2018 was the first time in quite some time that the library uh, renovated or redid, um, readdressed its uh, strategic planning process. Updating our vision, value, and mission statement. Um, the reason I bring this forward today is just because I want to stress that uh, a lot of the language that you would see in our mission statement is language that is also common to the uh, mayor and council ends and outcome statement that the city of Burnsville has. And that shouldn't be a surprise because we're all public servants. We're all interested in giving the best value that we possibly can to our residents. So you'll see common phrases in both the library's strategic plan and the city's um, ends and outcome statement about things like uh, accessibility to diverse populations, after school activities for teens and youth, um, supporting with uh, um, technology, um, access through the, uh, the community. Um, as I go through the presentation, I'll highlight a couple of these different items where I think there's some overlap between the mission of the city and the mission of the library. All right, 2018 it was a very busy year for the library. Um, some of the more traditional services that most people here are probably already familiar with. Uh, the library provides story time programs and classes to preschool age children. We've been doing that for years. Um, this past year, we've added the uh, um, kind of the added benefit of making this a much more academic curricula. We are stressing the idea that we want our story times to be educational, not just towards our four children, but also for the adults, because we want parents to learn the skills to teach early literacy at home, not just when they bring their kids to the library. So our curricula that we use at the library is very similar to the curricula that is used by school teachers in uh, kindergarten classes and first grade classes to develop early literacy skills in youth. Upper left corner, uh, the library has approximately uh, 45,000 titles that we make available to residents as ebooks. So these are materials that can be downloaded to a tablet or a uh, smartphone or another electronic device, or that you can listen to them as a downloadable audiobook. Um, our ebook collection has been growing steadily over the past few years and is, is getting the most use um, per resident of any portion of the collection that we purchase. Lower left corner, the Burnsville Library just this past year launched homework help sessions for teens in the after um, school time frame on Wednesdays and Thursdays, 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, we have a lot of interest from residents, and actually it's for ages beyond teens, so we do this actually for grade school all the way up to high school. Um, I can tell you Thursday nights are busier now than they've ever been in the past as more and more families are taking advantage of the homework help services, particularly some of the diverse populations uh, for whom English may be a second language. Like the city, the library also has a variety of data points that we track throughout the year. Um, Dakota County is very much a data-driven organization. The library is no exception there. Um, this past year, the library had over 280,000 visitors. That's the equivalent of filling up the Twin Stadium to capacity seven times. That's a lot of people visiting the library. Uh, in fact, um, there are about a 360 libraries in the state of Minnesota. If you think of there being one library for every day of the year, that's a good mental model. The Burnsville Library is in the 90th percentile in just about every metric you can um, bring forward. We are an extremely busy library, and I hope the community is proud of the fact that their library is being used so heavily. Materials borrowed. We had the equivalent of uh, every resident in Burnsville borrowing night items this past year, so we circulated about 550,000 items um, based on the most recent population estimates for the city of Burnsville. That's nine items per resident. So for those of you that didn't stop by the library and check out nine items last year, you can see me after the presentation. <laughs> Online access. So the library provides internet access a couple of different ways. Um, we have the traditional desktop PCs that uh, residents who don't have technology at home can stop by and use when they visit the library. We also have a very robust wireless network, and right now our wireless network accounts for about two-thirds of the total hours 118,000 hours that were logged in 2018. Um, what we're seeing is that as more and more people have devices like smartphones and tablets and laptops, they prefer to use their technology when they visit the library rather than the technology that we make available, which is understandable. In fact, we have some individuals who come in as soon as we open our doors and they're there all day. Uh, we do have at least a few folks that also run their private businesses off of our wireless network. <laughs> so that 118,000 hours, that is the equivalent of being online 24-7 for over 13 years. My 13-year-old thought that was amazing. That just makes my head hurt. All right, website traffic. The library is by a wide margin the most heavily trafficked website on the county's domain. So we have more visits per year than any other department in Dakota County. Last year we had 1.2 million visits. 
Um, number two, if you like trivia, the most second, second most heavily trafficked website commissioner is the Daily Jail Bookings. <laughs> so our competition is the Daily Jail Bookings. <laughs> All right, so the library in the future. Um, 2019, we have a couple of different new um, initiatives planned. We've just installed our first permanent uh, 3D printer, and we've also started putting Macs in the library. We put our first Mac in just about a month ago, and the Mac comes preloaded with the Adobe Creative Suite, which means we make Adobe Photoshop available for free now to anybody that wants to sign up to use the technology in the library. For those of you that may not be familiar with 3D printers, ask any of your kids or grandkids because these things are showing up all the time now in the public schools. Um, it's used to print out in a plastic um, form some kind of a 3D image that can either be downloaded or custom designed. We had a, a student in at one of the other libraries in the county who designed his own chessboard, only he put his own face on all of the chess pieces. So all kinds of strange and creative uses that can be used uh, or that this uh, 3D printer can be used to, to, uh, to do. Um, 3D printing is going to be a big trend um, in schools in the future. More and more schools are adding them. Every district, I believe, in Dakota County now has some kind of a 3D printer technology available. And what we're hearing is that students are now showing up in the libraries expecting that this technology is going to be there. So we are doing our best to, to meet that anticipated need. Lower right corner, um, this is an image from a story walk, and this is a collaboration between the library and the city of Burnsville's Park and Rec Department. Mm -hmm. We are going to be setting up pages of children's books at one of the parks this summer, and I'm sorry I can't remember exactly which park that's going to be, but the idea is that as parents and families walk along, they can read a book progressively as they walk the walk trails around the park. Um, and this is a partnership that I'm really looking forward to because it will give me an excuse to get out of the office. <laughs> All right, and that's everything that I had for you today. I kept it brief. Michelle, I promised you 10 minutes or less. I hope I made it. Um, if there are any questions, you're welcome to ask now or if you want to drop me a line or get in contact later. This also, uh, for our residents at home, we are looking for your ideas. We want to have opportunities to collaborate with other city departments. Um, don't hesitate to get in touch. So, Mr. Luber, I know that uh, the library also has rooms that are for rent for events, and also the um, uh, license true. function is at the library. So can you talk a little bit more about all of the other uh, sure. amenities that you offer? Sure. Um, so, um, Mayor, you mentioned the, the meeting rooms that we make available. The library has um, about, I think it's 10 total individual study rooms for people to come in and use where you can actually close the door in a private room to do whatever mm -hmm. work or business you need to do. The library also has a um, um, kind of a council room that has seating for about a dozen people. We've got a uh, conference table set up. And then we have a large meeting room that has a capacity of about 150. Um, so residents can come in for larger events or venues. Um, we make all of those meeting spaces available for the public. We take reservations on the conference room and reservations on the large meeting room. You can book up to three months in advance. So if you have a need for a public meeting space, the uh, only restriction we have at this point is that you can't sell anything. So we can't allow the rooms to be <coughs> used for um, sales transactions right now. And then, Mayor, you would also mentioned the uh, Dakota County License Center is co-located with the library. Um, this is uh, one of the busier license centers in the area. In fact, this morning at 8 o'clock when they opened the doors, there was a line of people waiting outside in the snow to get in. And actually, I was one of them. I got my first real ID paperwork filed today. I thought it would be a slow day, and I was wrong. Um, but yeah, the license center is a, um, part of the, the same building. So for residents who might be new to the area, if you need to do anything with license or tabs, you can stop by the library in the license center campus. And how much is the charge for the rooms? Rooms are free. And that's what I wanted our residents to hear. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilmember Keeley. I don't know if you touched on this. Do you check out tablets to guests, like to check out books? We don't check out tablets uh, at this library, but the library in uh, Apple Valley and the library in Hastings are testing a checkout of Chromebooks right now. Uh, most of the, the students that... Uh, are in districts in Dakota County have access to either a uh, iPad or a Chromebook that is loaned by the school. And we do have uh, families that come in occasionally or individuals who come in and for whatever reason their laptop may not be working so they ask if we have a device that they might use. We can give them a Chromebook in those two locations. Um, we're kind of testing the waters right now with this loaning of that particular type of technology to see if it's something we want to roll out at all the libraries. I noticed and Rue was reading it's 
seems to be popular around the country with a lot of libraries is uh, for those folks who can't afford the technology, like checking out a book, check out a reader, an e-reader, et cetera, sure. that type of thing. So thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Mr. Luber? Thank you so much for coming in Thank and you. sharing with us what's going on at the library. Thank you. It really is a very busy place. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And now we will go to um, Regina Dean and a business banner check in. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Thank you for moving me up on the agenda as well. I appreciate that audience too. Um, so this um, item originated at a council work session in um, 2018, or the all day, your all day work session. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the topics that was brought up was um, let's be more flexible to our school districts so that they can celebrate some of the achievements. Um, there, we were a little restrictive on, on what we would allow. So we made some changes to the city code mm -hmm. and then it got brought up. Why don't we look at our business um, and commercial districts as well? And is there an opportunity to be more flexible there as well? Um, so we took that information, um, added it to the Economic Development Commission and Planning Commission work plans. Um, brought forward a draft ordinance to our planning commission um, to garnish some feedback, and then um, also to the Chamber of Commerce Public Policy Committee and our EDC. Um, took some of the information that was um, proposed, reworked some draft ordinance, um, and ultimately what we came up with was um, an opportunity to remove some of our content-based content language um, within the city code um, to make our code more flexible to allow um, more opportunity for someone that wants to add a temporary banner to their site um, to perhaps say, we had sections of the code that, or we still do, sections of the code that talk about you can have a now hiring sign, you can have a for lease sign, you can have a um, special event um, sign. And we really talked a lot about content. What we want to do is remove that um, and allow someone to have a banner that's certain square footage for a certain amount of time, but we don't want to talk about what they can or cannot have on that banner. So if they want to say on that banner, whatever they want to say, um, that it could be now hiring, it could be for lease, it could be um, a sale, 99 cents for soda, um, then they can have that as long as they um, are temporary in nature and meet um, our banner criteria that we have spelled out in the code. Um, so ultimately, um, what we want to do is, is remove some barriers, make it more flexible, um, take out a lot of the, there was some confusion also within our city code that talked about for lease signs, for sale signs, construction signs, development signs, and we really want to take out some of that content, condense it, and make it more user friendly. Um, essentially, we'll, our proposal is to remove about four pages of content um, that there was conflicting information as well and make it nice and concise and easy for not only staff to interpret, but also for um, our sign companies and our property owners to interpret as well. Um, ultimately, we also want to simplify our permitting process um, so that, for example, if someone were to apply for a roofing permit um, it's essentially can be issued over the counter. We want to do that for our temporary banner signs as well, so that um, that cuts down on any any staff time um, and makes it easier for our businesses to obtain what they need in an um, efficient um, manner. Um, this is just a listing of the type of temporary signs that we do allow today. And then highlighted in yellow are the items that we want to simplify and um, make more user friendly. We don't propose to make any changes to our special event signs, our legacy event signs, or community event signs at this mm -hmm. time. Um, it's strictly um, the business banners and to allow that flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, we do want to touch 
on the real estate signs too, and, and again, make that more simplified and easier to use. Um, next steps, what we envision is that we'll bring forward a um, proposed ordinance, ordinance amendment to our planning commission um, for a public hearing and then to city council for approval. We anticipate that could happen as early as March um, or April, and then um, following would be your approval. Okay. Are there any questions or additions or things that you um, would um, like included Members of the or council, uh, has staff met the uh, direction <laughs> in terms of simplifying the sign and yes. uh, making it uh, yeah. user friendly? Thumbs up. Yes, okay, absolutely. so Thank then uh, let's move forward to the public hearing then. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And thank you for the work. And because, you know, we always bring in our stakeholders and get their feedback, mm -hmm. and uh, you've done some really great job. So thank you very much. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency presentation regarding the landfill closure. And um, Jenny, are you going to start this off and then uh, with uh, Mr. Kirk Kadelka? Who's gonna have I, Kirk, are you going to? Yeah. Madam Mayor, I can do the introduction, yeah, certainly. I think that would be good if you would introduce and then Kirk and the right one? Uh, Jamie. Yeah, or do you want the other one? Yep, it's the other one. Does that work? Just hover over that. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, this presentation by the MPCA is twofold, and it comes as a follow-up to the October 15th work session, uh, where you heard in uh, some detail about an emerging option for closure of freeway landfill and expansion of uh, Burnsville Sanitary Landfill mm -hmm. and expansion of the Kramer Quarry or KMM Quarry. Um, after that meeting, I think there were some uh, questions about process, MPCA, next steps. So uh, we did um, extend an invitation to the MPCA staff to come and give an overview of um, the status of freeway landfill and what's involved with that and the closure process. Mm -hmm. And then the second part on the permitting process with certificates of need and things that are needed to expand a landfill. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I do want to extend a thank you to the MPCA and their staff for coming out and um, helping to educate us on what their process is are and hopefully you'll find it very helpful. Thank you and for everyone's um, information this is uh, information item and uh, there will be a discussion or questions and so Kirk and Jamie thank you so much for being here and to everyone from the MPCA uh, we've been working with you for a long time on, on this particular item hopefully to get to a conclusion and a way that we can move forward. So thank you for coming and helping to educate us. Thank you, Council uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Kirk Adelka, as mentioned. I'm an Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I work on land policy issues, which include our cleanup programs, but also our solid waste and a number of other programs. And as mentioned, we're going to have two presentations, but we're going to start off with the freeway landfill and dump. And just want to quick um, highlight a couple things. We know that you know uh, quite well the situation at the facility, but we do have some introductory slides that just kind of go through the current condition and the future condition and what our concerns are about potential risk to human health and the environment as a result. And then also an update on what we've been doing in the last year or so to bring uh, closure and making sure we address those risks. And you'll see some more details on a dig and line option that we are working on. We know a third party has proposed a dig and haul option, which would be taking the waste off the site. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. It is more of a concept and less details than our dig and line facility at this point or or idea. So we will, we'll get to that a little bit more in the um, last half of the presentation where we have a number of kind of questions or, or things that we'll talk about. There are a number of challenges that are ahead of us on all the options, and we'll highlight those. So with that, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Jamie, just to go through. Oh, actually, I think I, I'm the first one here. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> so just to, to start with, um, this is something you'll hear very often from the agencies. There are three ways to handle waste. You can prevent it, you can manage it, and you can clean it up. And as you go in this box here, the further you go down, the more expensive it becomes and the more potential risk there are to folks. And we talk about this not only in the terms of the closed landfill program, which you see here today, which is at the bottom half of the cleanup, but it's also important to remember when we have our second presentation dealing with the expansion of a proposed landfill. Because the 
falls in that middle category there of managing it, and that is does have more cost and potential um, considerations as a result than being uh, doing the upfront work of preventing it that the state and the county and the local units of government are are doing. So the closed landfill program was created in 1994, and so this really came about where we started having landfills and started seeing releases in groundwater and others, methane, and had to address the situation. The typical way for a contaminated site to be addressed with in Minnesota and the nation is through the Superfund process. And that's where the responsible party is then required to pay for the cleanup. In the case of a Superfund, you may have one, two, or three parties. And then they're told to come up with a plan where the agency or EPA will then look at it and make sure it's protective human health and environment, and they move forward. If there's more than one party, those parties then divide amongst themselves what is their fair share of paying the cost. That's outside the realm of, of government. When we apply this model to a landfill, it becomes much more difficult. We have many more folks that are bringing waste to the landfill. So it's not only the landfill owner that is a potential responsible party, it's anyone who's disposed of waste there. And so you see the easy ones with companies that may, large companies brought their own trucks there, but then you start seeing haulers. And so what happened in the 80s and early 90s is when Superfund started to be applied in Minnesota, and this happened to a number of landfills in the northern metropolitan area, is that this circle expanded. Not only were those folks who were bringing waste to the landfill were then um, being sought for cost recovery and to do the work, they also then went to their customers. So imagine the customer list for a hauler. They have all kinds of small businesses in that. And so they started receiving letters saying that you have to pay thousands or hundreds of dollars to contribute your fair share to the cleanup. What happened is we bogged down in administrative paperwork and, and lawyers, and we didn't get anything done cleaning up. And so as a result of looking at this, the Minnesota legislature created the Closed Landfill Program. This is the only program like it in the nation. And what it said is, landfills are a societal problem. We all contributed. We're all the re potential responsible parties. So we'll have that effort to help do the cleanup of the properties. And so that's the, how the Closed Landfill Program was created. As a result, then, the, the deal that's provided to landfill operators is you provide, you turn over the landfill to the state, and the state will then t take care on the long-term liabilities of taking care of the landfills. As we know, uh, these facilities still need care long after they accept their waste and they have no revenue source. And so the state does that. At the same time, the state also asks for the insurance policies for each of the landfill operators. And the state, along with the AG's office, had class action um, uh, global settlements, excuse me, is the correct term, uh, with all of them to help seek some of the costs that we've been using to um, cost, seek some of the cost recovery that we've been using to do the work so far at, at a number of landfills. And so today we have 110 landfills that are under enrollment in the program today. Freeway entered the program in 2017. Um, it, this is a little different. In every other case, it was a voluntary arrangement where they signed a binding agreement. Uh, a couple years ago, because of legislation that was passed, they created an involuntary approach. If the voluntary approach did not work, there was this involuntary approach with the program entered in, the landfill entered into the program, and this allowed for the protections for all the potential responsible parties. As you may remember, uh, 180 plus folks a uh, number of years ago got a letter from the EPA saying you're a potential responsible party and you need to start providing that information. Yeah. And that created a rush to the legislature by those parties uh, seeking the same protections that were provided to everyone else in all the other 110 landfills, the, excuse me, 109 landfills that had entered the program. So the legislature created a, a program to protect those individuals who were doing the right things on their own time, but were being held up because uh, the owner was not entering into the, the site. And so this has created now a, a second option into the program. So we prioritize our work based on risk. We have a risk score on any landfill that we have, and this is really driven by a couple things. And, and you can see the, the bullets on the slide, and I'm not going to go through them all. But a uh, freeway landfill and another landfill in uh, North Metro oscillate uh, between number one and two as our highest risk sites. So this is a very high priority for the agency. A lot of work has been done on the others that have lowered their risk, and these are the two that are remaining. And we've spent a number of years um, laying the groundwork to continue to, to move forward at this site. So with that, I'm going to turn over my colleague at this time, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Jamie Wallerstedt. Um, I'm a supervisor at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and I'm um, working on the freeway landfill project um, with a team that we have here tonight. Um, 
just for a little perspective, this photo, um, the the lower part of the screen is the Burnsville landfill um, owned by Waste Management. In the middle of the screen is the Kramer Quarry. Um, and the freeway landfill and dump are on the, the top portions of the screen um, with the Minnesota River off to the left there. Um, but what, what we like about this picture is it does show where the Burnsville drinking water supply is in relation to um, the freeway landfill and the freeway dump. Kind of gives a perspective there. Uh, just a little bit of history on the freeway landfill and dump. Um, the freeway dump is about 28 acres, and it operated from 1961 to 1971. Um, that's on the picture. That's on the, the right side or on the east side of the freeway. On the left side of the freeway is the freeway landfill. That's 150, approximately 150 acres, um, and that operated from 1969 to 1990 is when it stopped receiving waste. Um, in total, there's about 6 million cubic yards between the freeway landfill and the freeway dump. Um, it shows approximate there as we are still um, investigating the waste, the waste footprint on both the landfill side and the dump side. Both the landfill and the dump are unlined, meaning um, they're, the waste is right on either soil or bedrock, um, and they're both located above the drinking water source for both Burnsville and Savage. Um, and we have some pictures on the next, we have some graphics on the next slide where we can talk about kind of the conceptual model out there. But it was built on a former wetland just south of the Minnesota, south and adjacent to the Minnesota River, which is typical of um, some of these old landfills. They would put waste in low areas. So. Probably not the best spot. Uh, the next two slides are some um, graphics that we created to illustrate what's currently going on at the freeway landfill and dump, um, and then the the follow or the next slide will be what we predict to happen into the future. So currently, the the landfill and the dump are both online. Um, as you can see, Kramer Quarry to the south of the freeway landfill is currently dewatering um, for, their op for their mining operations. So they're drawing down the water table. Um, so currently, the waste at freeway landfill and freeway dump are not sitting in the groundwater. Um, but as you can see, as rain falls on the landfill or during seasonal flooding of the Minnesota River, uh, the waste within the landfill and the dump are inundated with water and contam contamination can spread that way currently. Um, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, the Burnsville drinking water source at the Kramer um, mine does take 2.5 million gallons per day on average. Um, and then there's also the municipal, or yeah, sorry, the Burnsville municipal wells that are south of the freeway dump um, that are nearby. Um, so this is the predicted future conditions for groundwater um, out at the site. As you can see, Kramer mining is no longer pumping the dewatering water, and so the water level um, will rise and will fill in that Kramer quarry once they stop pumping. Um, Burnsville and Savage drinking water supplies will still be there pumping approximately 3.4 million gallons per day. Um, and the Burnsville Municipal Wells just south of the dump are planned to stay in place as well. Um, the, the waste will be in water at both the landfill and the dump. And this illustrates if a response action is not put in place. So this would be future conditions with no liner at the two facilities. This is our modeling results that we um, conducted a couple of years ago in 2015. The picture on the left-hand side where the red is, um, where the red area is, is actually illustrating where there would be waste in direct contact with groundwater in the months following um, Kramer stopping their dewatering operations. So that's where the waste would be in direct contact with water. On the right-hand side is the groundwater contamination that would emanate from that waste being um, in the groundwater. Um, and this is, like I said, just a couple, this is a predicted condition 
a couple of months after the dewatering operations cease. Um, and so as that time kind of goes on with Kramer not pumping, that would then um, get worse. So. In 2018, after um, freeway landfill entered the program, entered the closed landfill program in 27, after 2017 legislation, in 2018 we did an uh, investigation um, because we didn't have a lot of information at the freeway dump. Um, so the investigation was aimed at delineating the waste footprint at both the freeway landfill and the freeway dump. So we did some test pitting out there. Um, and we also did a lot of borings out at freeway dump to understand how thick the cap was, what the waste consisted of, um, and where the bottom of the waste was. Um, and then we, so we took soil samples and we took groundwater samples during that time. Um, we were not able to delineate the waste footprint at either the freeway landfill or the freeway dump at that time. Um, we did some test pitting, but we weren't able to reach the edges of the waste. Uh, we also found that methane was detected above the lower explosive limit at both the landfill and the dump. Um, the groundwater samples that we were able to grab um, from both the landfill and the dump, we compared them to two values. One value is the health values um, that the Department of Health sets for drinking water standards. And then the other value that we compared it to were surface water values because of the threat of the Minnesota River nearby. So we compared groundwater to both of those values. Um, and we found that 1,4-dioxane uh, PFAS, which is formerly known as PFCs or perfluorinated compounds that um, are in the East Metro, we found volatile organic compounds um, and then we found metals above the drinking water criteria. Um, above the surface water criteria, we, we found volatile organic compounds and metals. Yes, yeah. Ryan. Could you, um, could you just clarify that that's not where the impacting the water that the Burnsville is currently taking? Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. And the other is that because uh, there are others who are interested because uh, this is in the uh, Jordan Aquifer, and then how many communities draw from that groundwater? So the groundwater we um, sampled was just at, it's at, in an aquifer above the Jordan and above the, the Prairie du Chien, which is where Kramer's mining, and then the Jordan is where the city gets their drinking water yeah. from. So the water we sampled is above that, and it is not impacting um, those aquifers at the time. And thank you for the clarification, Ryan. Yeah. Um, we did also sample the intake um, at the drinking water um, intake at the Kramer Quarry, and we sampled um, the wells south of the dump, and they are not impacted. Okay. I think that is good information for our citizens as they're listening. Some of the conceptual design options that we are looking at, so part of the process um, during a cleanup effort is to do an environmental investigation, which is underway, and then we move towards um, a feasibility study to look at different options for, for the site. Um, and so we are embarking on the feasibility study and conceptual design <coughs> um, currently. And for a dig in line, we looked at four different options. Um, we looked at kind of the bookends of how the footprint of the dig and line um, landfill would eventually be. So we looked at a smallest footprint when we were looking at lining it, and we looked at the largest footprint. So that would result, the smallest footprint would result in the tallest landfill, um, closed landfill, and then the largest footprint would result in the lowest closed landfill. Um, and then we looked at a balanced approach, a hybrid of um, options one and two, and I have some pictures that we'll show you um, with with that. And then we also looked at expanding the land, the freeway landfill to the west into an existing um, quarry that's owned by McGowan. Um, and that's no longer being considered because there are a lot of environmental impacts with that option. The quarry would have to be um, filled in and built up to um, above the, the flooding elevation of the river. Um, as far as a dig and haul option, we're looking at two options there. One is off-site disposal at an open landfill, 
Um, and then one is we're, we're um, looking at the existing soil at freeway or the existing waste at freeway to see whether it would be suitable for incineration at a waste mm -hmm. energy facility. <coughs> this um, table um, zeroes in on the dig and line options, the three dig and line options that we're still considering. Like I said previously, the the well, the zero column is the existing conditions. Um, and then the, f the first option that we're looking at is that smallest footprint with the tallest um, finished elevation. The, sec the second option is the largest footprint with the lowest elevation. And then the third option would be that hybrid. Um, so as you can see, the tallest option results in an elevation of the finished closed landfill at 850 feet above mean sea level. Um, and the lowest option would be 776 above mean sea level. And then the hybrid would be about 785. Um, the, the duration to construct the landfills would be anywhere from three to four years. Um, and then the cost ranges from 93 million to 116 million. <coughs> However, these are these were based on 2017 cost and what we knew of the landfill and dump before we embarked on the 2018 and 2019 investigations. Um, so, so those costs are increasing and I have some slides about that. Um, the area not needed for the landfill, the second row up there, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so as we looked at the, the waste footprint, there, there would be area available that we would not need to retain um, at, within the waste footprint and within buffer area for stormwater management, leachate management, or just keeping development away from the landfill. And so that's what that row is. Um, so that ranges from 10 acres to 40 acres, depending on the option. <clears throat> So our estimated cleanup costs, and in 2017, we did um, receive $3 million uh, from the legislature from our closed landfill investment fund. Um, we did uh, request a bond for a portion of the cleanup costs at that time, and that bond was not received um, with the legislature. So our costs, what we have been finding is um, in our designs, our costs are increasing at the bottom there. You can see it. We're, we're estimating we're at least $100 million as of today. Um, and those costs are increasing because we're finding emerging contaminants like 1,4-dioxane and PFAS. Um, the waste at the dump, we have determined that the dump waste cannot remain in place and that we do need to move that over to the landfill side um, because the waste doesn't look any different between the landfill and the dump, what's actually in the waste. Um, so we would like to consolidate that um, and that we are having unanticipated legal costs to gain access. So some of the uncertainties and why the, the costs are, are going up, um, and we still want to recognize these uncertainties um, as we move through the design feasibility and design process. Um, the volume of waste, like I mentioned before, we still haven't delineated that totally yet. Uh, we're still looking at the existing cover soils, depending, you know, can we reuse some of that cover soil or do we have to bring all new in? Um, liner design is, is um, uncertain at this point in time because of what we're finding with some of the emerging contaminants and with PFAS. We have to figure out our liner design. Um, and then leachate treatment as well. The pie chart on the right-hand side just gives a, a illustration of how the costs are broken up into the different aspects of a construction project. Um, that, the pie chart is for a dig and lined um, uh, response action. If we were to look at a dig and haul response action, that pie chart would look a little different. However, the only things um, that would that would um, be replaced is the leachate management, the liner, and the cover would probably be replaced with tipping fees, um, a tipping fee cost if we were to haul it to an open landfill. Okay. So our next steps, um, we are 
currently, hopefully, um, getting out on the site to complete our 2019 investigation and sampling. And like I mentioned previously, um, the objectives of that investigation is to delineate the waste extents on both the landfill um, and the dump. We are going to do a more comprehensive water sampling um, at the, the landfill and the dump for all the existing wells, and we're also going to install um, some more wells out there. Uh, we are going to sample the bedrock underneath the landfill to see if that is impacted. We're going to actually get a sample of the bedrock material. Um, and there is a concern um, about vapor intrusion south of the dump on the mini storage property. Um, so we've been working with the mini storage owners to gain access to, to do a, vap a vapor intrusion um, investigation at that property. Um, we are working with the EPA. This is an NP, a national priorities list site, and so we do have to follow the EPA process. Um, so we are working closely with the EPA as well. Um, and then we're moving into design, and we will. We're planning on having a public meeting once we get through some of these, some of these initial investigation and preliminary design. And so I'm going to just take it over a little bit here, and these this is more some of the questions that uh, we have for to be answered, some of the challenges that still are for the state and, and the county and uh, the city as we move forward. <coughs> the first is on the dig and line options. As you can see, there's a number of options there, and we're looking to minimize those options and really hone in on the dig and line option, one of them as we move forward to the community meetings and elsewhere. This will help really help us uh, reduce the amount of time it takes versus designing three different types of landfills with our contractors and reduce those costs. So we're looking for input from uh, Burnsville and surrounding communities on that option. The other piece here really are some of the um, financial challenges that we're going to have. In the case of a, a dig and haul, um, we, we really talk about it as a third party need doing this activity. And the reason we do that, well, we know that there's one uh, specific party that's um, come and talked to the community here about it. Mm -hmm. But as we move forward with this, the agency and the state have to make sure that we have create a level playing field for any third party that may want to uh, propose a dig and haul option as we move forward through our various types of processes I'll talk about here. So you'll hear us referring uh, more generically to this as a third party option to do a dig and haul. And that means not only digging the land uh, material from um, freeway here, but could go to any landfill. And previously we have had others contact us also about that option, about taking the waste to another uh, um, facility. And so we'll make this any information available to all parties to make sure we have a, a fair and balanced approach. The first is the true cost of a Dagan Hall um, piece. I know we've had conversations with folks and, and there's been some general discussion about this is a, will cost the same as what the state is proposing. And as we go through, we can see our uh, detailed estimates on it. However, when we've tried to emulate those numbers, we come up close to a, a $200 million cost on a Dagan Hall option to a nearby facility. And this real driver here is the tipping fees. If you look at a $30 per ton tipping fee, that's over you know, $110, $120 million just to deposit the waste in another piece, not including the other parts of the pie chart you see there. So it, um, we need to see some more of the details on how that is as a state to be able to provide feedback there. But this is a challenge because any third party that wants to make a proposal here they also want to have um, some ability to, to um, keep their details um, under wraps so that when they go into a bidding process, they're on equal footing as anyone else. So this creates a challenge. We don't want to disqualify or put a potential vendor at an unfair advantage by knowing the details there. But we also need to know the how much it is because at the end of the day, we need to ask the legislature on how to move forward with this. And so one of the things that we're looking at, and this is a potential option, is doing a dual bid. As you know, for any one of your road projects, you put out one spec and you do that bid, and then you, um, you get multiple contractors. One of the options we're looking at is putting out two different specs. And then uh, not only are we comparing contractors doing um, both options, but we can compare them against each other. And that will allow for uh, private developers or, or third parties to run their cost, and then we can actually see what they are once we have an, they're on equal footing with everyone else and they're opened up during the bid. <coughs> 
process and we can compare what is the true cost. It's more work, it's still a concept, but it's one way that we think we can do this in a way that doesn't automatically um, put a ven one vendor at a disadvantage or uh, take the dig and haul option off the table. The next challenge that we're facing, and this one uh, poses also for the dig and, um, dig and line in place, is uh, the source of the dollars. Um, as you may know, bonding dollars um, it used will carry our use restriction. And for general obligation bonds, that's a 37 and a half year restriction on um, private enterprise on it. It has to fulfill the, the public um, purpose of the program. And even a state cannot earn income where there's um, general bond dollars are being used. And so that creates, um, creates a, a problem. We know that there's an existing business on the facility. Uh, if that was the hope is to keep that operating, that's a challenge. If uh, de a development proposal were on a dig and haul and you take the waste someplace else and you want to have private activity, there is that 37 and a half year restriction there. There are other funding sources, obviously, um, use of uh, non taxable general obligation bonds, revenue bonds. But in consulting with um, MMB, which oversees the bonding for the state, those are more expensive. Uh, options so that would raise up the cost and and there would have to be that difference made up by some party in addition the other option is cash but we know this is a, a highly unlikely amount given the um, cost that we'd be asking for and uh, the only option might be you know another revenue source to fund that dollars uh, in, a, in a different way than uh, just using general state dollars um, the next one is, is something we've had heard concerns uh, at the legislature when we pitched the idea. So we did go to the House Bonding Committee last year and had a discussion with them about, as, as my colleague mentioned, basically the first half of the installment of the construction project. And we heard uh, very strong concerns from both sides of the aisle about the concept of a potential windfall by the owner. Um, no matter who the owner is, the, the thought is if the state is paying $100 million plus to clean up the property and then the, the owner has no um, skin in the game, so to speak, you know, how does, how, what is the protection for the, the, um, the taxpayers? This is a concern, uh, you know, no matter who the owner is, this, this is going to come into to play, we, we foresee. And it's something that we heard loud and clear, not only in the public meeting, but conversations afterwards as we continue to find, ask questions about, you know, what are the issues that uh, we're putting a pause on it, other than the large size. I mean, uh, $100 million or what we were asking for, then, you know, a little bit over $50 million is a large chunk of a bonding bill. And so there's a potential option here, and that's the, the windfall lien. This is something used by the federal government and the state of Washington. And so when the federal government, EPA, goes in and does a cleanup, and then um, maybe sells the property or someone else sells the property, they put a windfall lien on it. And so it's not for a cost recovery like a Superfund site, but it's for the, the increase in the market value because the property's cleaned up, which may be less than actually the actual cost of cleaning up the property. And so this is an option that we uh, have seen in Washington. We've put together a draft language to it and shared it with some members. It seemed to gain a little traction, uh, although it was – you know, something we talked about later in the in the legislative session. <clears throat> so those are some of the challenges um, that we or questions that we all need to answer. The those answers will really determine which of three paths forward we can see when we look at the larger issue of financing it. We can go through the standard um, process, which is we pick one option, ask for that money for the legislature. <laughs> and then um, find out where the bids go and assign a contractor. And then it would be a very narrow option. We'd have to pick a dig and line or a dig and haul option and move forward with that. And that's traditionally how we've done it. The other ones are still concepts, but we've been trying to work with Department of Admin and seeing if there's a dual bid process where we I talked a little earlier about where we could do a dig and haul and a dig and line at the same time and still provide uh, some uh, more flexibility and still look at what the low cost option is for the state. And as an agency, that's something, you know, as we put forward our recommendations on the amount of funding level for it, we have to not only consider this landfill, but the other 109 in the program. And just to give you a scope of what we're looking at, we do an obligation memo every year 
uh, in our next 30 years of obligations. And we estimate right now $277 million will be needed over the next 30 years for all the landfills, including land, uh, freeway landfill. So as we're looking at um, you know larger costs for various options, that means there's less money to be used at other landfills, which is a balancing act that we have to do. The third one is a brownfield grant process. Uh, right now, if you look at any other um, contaminated site and someone wants to come in and do a brownfield, we're trying to look to see how that would work with the closed landfill program. Because the um, closed landfill program, the state is still on the hook for the long-term operation and maintenance of these uh, facilities in the perpetuity. But if a third party did it with a brownfield grant, how that would work, and we'd have to answer a number of questions, you know, what is the cost sharing of it or the like. But it is a different tax, um, which would leave less in the control of the state, but may allow for other flexibilities. Uh, all these things, these last two, again, are concepts. We're still doing our additional work to see how we can do it administratively. We have a meeting set up with the city staff and the county staff to talk in more detail about these, as they both have been great partners in this to help and try to find a creative solution to this. But at the end of the day, uh, we do need to do a cost-effective solution here um, to, to move forward before you see the charts that were mentioned earlier where Kramer Quarry stops pop, uh, pumping. And so with that, uh, Mayor and, and, and Council members, uh, we're hope you, more than happy to answer any questions or open any other thoughts you have at this time on this segment. Um, Thank you. That was very informative. Uh, there are some questions, but I also want to make sure that um, when we get to the part where on October 15th we had Kramer Mining and Materials present, and you have all of that information in the background, as well as waste management. So I'm going to circle back on some of that to see what your thoughts are, because you talk about a third party. But uh, Dan. When you talk about the, the dig and line out there, um, if that were a building you were building, how many stories would that be that we'd be putting up above ground here in the entrance to Burnsville? Um, the the finished elevation of um, a dig in line with the maximum height mm -hmm. with smallest footprint would be 850 feet. That's 100 feet above where the current freeway landfill is. So it would be 100 feet higher. 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 Okay. Thank you. Next story. Okay. You know what I'll just uh, If it's, yeah, it'd be like ten, a 10-story ten ten building. 10-story building, yep. right? That's yep. what I'm trying to get at, I guess. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Because um, it's very nice that we have clarity and information in terms of the MPCA's work and the amount of money that you have there and what you need to do. On October 15th, and you've gotten all of that background, and we also had the background for us to refresh our mem memory. October 15th, we had a presentation by both Waste Management and Kramer Mining and Material. So Kramer wanted to purchase, uh, to have an agreement to purchase from McGowan the landfill and the dump, and then do the cleanup. How does that work with the MPCA? Is that does that fall into your bidding uh, because it's in the clean landfill program, or where is that? Mm -hmm. Help us understand and bridge that connection. So there's a, um, a couple different pieces here. Uh, the closed landfill program al allows for many types of ownership, public or private. So changing of ownership between two entities is not a problem and something that could be done through the program. The, the question then um, would be how do we move forward with it? So the, the dual process, if you did a, a dig in haul or that, it could be the state would be the one doing the work, hire a contractor, and a third party then could be the contractor, in this case, um, um, the vendor you talked about, could be the one that uh, submits their bid to, to do the work, who happens to also be, at that time, if there's an ownership change, the owner. So they could <coughs> do it that way. The Brownfield piece would be would allow for uh, a different piece where they would come to, uh, to us with a plan. Instead of meeting our um, specific plan that we might put out there, they might be able to propose their own plan. We bring them through our Brownfields and, and voluntary investigation and cleanup program. The state would still have the oversight in making sure that the remedy is protective human health and the environment. 
but they're more in control of doing the, the work. Okay. In, in both options, the question is, how does the funding flow also? Um, in, the f in the first one I mentioned, it's the money flows to the state and we pay a contractor to do the work. And the other one, it might be uh, the proposer would get the money through a, a grant program and then do the work. So it, 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 there's a, a lot of details yet to be figured out on how either could be accomplished, but there, there may be pathways. Okay. So, Mr. McGowan and Mr. Rizzo, where are you guys at? I'd like to save my comments until later, if I may. Okay. Please. Because those are some of the issues if we're going to move forward, and uh, then we need to understand what's the legislative piece, because it's a priority for us. So, John? Our, our, where we're at right now is we're still developing techniques, processes, and methods for which we would remediate the, the landfill. We have, uh, we have uh, conversations between uh, Mike and myself are right now uh, private and nothing I want to talk about in an open forum like this. And, um, but uh, our effort right now um, is to, if that opportunity comes, to be ready to move forward with a uh, well-vetted, legitimate process that can safely transfer the waste to waste management. And that's, that's, that's our effort. That's the team we put together, environmental team, construction team, legal team, consultations with MPC and others. Okay. So those consultations are going on between you and Kramer? Mayor and, and council members, yes. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to work on too is to provide to any person who's interested some more detail on kind of some of the things we would be looking for in that dig and haul option so that they can look at what type of components they need to cost out to be able to provide a little bit more direction to anyone who'd want to propose doing that. And that's something we're working on yet. We haven't been able to um, um, put that at, it's going to be at a high level document, and then that would help guide uh, folks to be able to fill in the details, as mentioned, to be of assistance. Ms. Kay, I just saw a news coverage between the governor and the legislature for end time of the, legisl of the uh, work of the legislature. Are we ever going to get to anything like that this year so we move forward or not? I'm just trying to manage our process. Mm -hmm. Mayor and, and council members, at this point, we don't see that we would be able to re uh, do this work in this legislative session. Uh, we, we will not uh, be putting forward a bonding request at this time for this legislative session. It's a non-bonding year, so it is a smaller bill to start with. Uh, there's a number of pieces of work we need to do. Um, uh, the earlier slide talks about where we're at on the 30% design piece. Um, and the goal is, you know, this summer or so to be closer to 60 percent. I think that will help us on uh, finalizing some numbers. If we're looking and creating some of those two other processes, whether it's a uh, brownfields piece or a dig and haul, I think we, were, we need to put some more details into that for the legislature to consider. Uh, I think right now it is uh, some of these other ideas are options and concepts. And uh, there's a lot of questions that I think the legislature will answer that we're not able to, to provide the, excuse me, they'll ask um, that we don't have the answers for today. Uh, what we do anticipate, as mentioned, the $3 million you saw there to um, continue our work on the uh, investigation and design work, that money um, does uh, no longer, uh, is no longer available after June 30th. So you anticipate to see the agency put a request forward to allow for that money to continue to work uh, into the summer and that that we need to do. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, we're the access piece we've been working on. We've been working on a number of uh, parties um, to do so. We haven't quite secured the, uh, the needed access for all the work we need to do. And so that, um, that investigation, how long that investigation takes at phase um, two of it, or um, B, uh, is, is going to help drive some of those timelines also. Okay. Dan. Uh, another follow-up uh, on your uh, digging line. I assume that that uh, ten stories of uh, trash that's lined will be there forever. Once you've done that, will there be any property left down there that you can develop on, or that people would want to develop on, or? 
Yep. So um, this this figure shows, if you can see it on the bottom, the green area is the smallest footprint, that green outline. That's the smallest footprint option. The, the red area is the area that we do not need for landfill or buffer area for the landfill. Um, so that would be area that is available um, for open space, development, what have you. Um, but that's area that we would leave. And that's area that you have, will have cleaned out when you build this, this Correct. mound. Correct. Yep. We're taking the waste and we're consolidating it um, into that green footprint area. And how many acres is that that's developable? Um, that's the 40 acre In the first option, um, the area not needed for landfill, that's the 40 acres in the first option. Uh, the second option, there's only 10 acres available. Um, and in that third option, there's 25 acres available. But one thing to note, um, the closed landfill program would take the waste out of that area. Um, and then we build it up to just above the, the flooding elevation of the river. Um, so there would still be work to build that area up if, the, if somebody wanted to develop it. So the options that were presented to us on October 15, 2018, was that uh, Kramer would do the work, the cleanup work and transport it over to waste management. So there won't have to be a dig in line. And so then um, Kramer will have the opportunity to then also work the, the and, um, and mine the, the limestone that's, that's left after the trash has been moved. What does that option and look like for the MPCA for our edification? I mean, that's probably one of the things that you talked about where there's someone who would come yeah. and there's a bid and then, yeah, or else you incinerate the, the trash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have had uh, legislative increase uh, interest in what the, the incineration cost of it would be, which is uh, much, much more expensive than a, a dig and haul option. And so it, mm -hmm. uh, feasibility, it just does not work. Um, um, the... For us, you know, that would, our first goal is, is a protective of human health and the environment. Right. And it could meet those goals by moving waste into a protective area. It's just, it's much like a digging line. It's just that the, the line facility is at another location. Um, so that would work. The big drivers for us is cost. What is the cost? Um, is the state paying for that work to be done? If it's done by a third party and they pay for all the costs, the, you know, as long as it's protective human health and the environment, it, it's still taken yeah. care of. We would still look, and the state may, um, depending on what the groundwater underneath it, we may still have to have some um, operation and maintenance of, of systems to make sure that that's taken care of. But, uh, I mean, that'll be something we'll have to determine at a, a future date. But we've done that with other locations where we've done development around monitoring wells or... Um, or um, events or the like, we would have to be creative with the proposer to be able to, to do that. And as, as mentioned, some of the additional tests that we're doing will help answer some more of the questions on what is in the groundwater, what is in some of the rock, um, to, to get some examples to help be able to answer some of those questions that are being asked of us. Okay. And it's good for our folks to hear that <coughs> the goals of the protection of human health and the environment. So, Vince. Have you dealt with any other landfill similar to this, with this characteristic of being closed for 25 years um, in the program? Uh, yeah, a, a lot of these are about the same age. They all came in in the 90s. Uh, a lot of landfills at the time decided um, in the 80s and that in the 90s, liners started to be required. So unlined landfills, all of our other ones are unlined. Usually there's some type of work done, whether it's consolidation of waste and a cover's put on it and mitigation systems to deal with uh, with methane or groundwater. We have done a dig in line uh, for the Washington County landfill um, in Lake Elmo. And so there has been uh, digging up the material and putting on a liner. And I think uh, another location too, most of them are handled in on site and not a liner underneath because they're in less air, um, 
areas where they pose less potential risk to others. We have a unique situation here where it's smack dab in the middle of two drinking water sources and the, and the river. We don't find that in other situations where it, it's in that type of locale. Any other questions for our guests from the MPC? Dan K. A uh, couple questions, a couple comments. This strikes me as something that you could call the clean fill, the landfill cleanup and drinking water protection plan. And we've seen two different options. Um, you have three options. I would like to refer those as one option with a really large pyramid at the gateway of our city, which isn't real attractive, uh, to be quite frank with you, and I'm sure it isn't to you. If you were one of us sitting here, you probably wouldn't um, look at those and say, well, this is ideal solution and, and the development around it. Wow, that should be exciting for those developers to come in and build next to a, a giant green pyramid. So in my mind, they're not really options, but they're what you have to do right now and what you have to work with. Um, the other one is a highly attractive option that, uh, that we've all been uh, share, shared with, and uh, it not only provides moving of the garbage out of that area, puts it in a lined landfill, but it creates an immense, very prosperous redevelopment area that brings revenue for the city, the county, the school district, and the state of Minnesota. So there's a return on investment calculation on that one. This one has a basically pretty much a closed end. It's a closed landfill. It's also a closed book as far as prosperity and redevelopment and opportunities for the state and everyone down the line, including us at the city, to um, see some revenue from and some development. Um, I'm curious, is uh, are there any historical examples that you've dealt with around the state or maybe around the country that you know of that are similar to this, where you have uh, an, uh, you know, private owned land and, and landfill, Superfund, et cetera, and what types of models came out of that as far as uh, partnerships, ownership changes, shared revenue, you know, that addressing that concern for undue enrichment to an owner type of thing. I mean, what other options have worked in the past or have been experienced? Well, for the closed landfill program, this is unique. Uh, most of the, the situations are, they are dealt with on, on site, and in many cases, the property is just turned over to the state. No, the person doesn't want anything more to, to deal with it. Um, it, but, you know, we have done what we can. In Superfund, we have uh, looked at options where some of those costs are shared. Um, there's a, a Superfund site in Minneapolis where um, the, the responsible party was not viable responsible party. The state couldn't recover any costs, and there were a lot of cleanup activities, including long-term mm -hmm. operation and maintenance costs that were to be done. In that case, a uh, private developer came in. It was in the urban area of Minneapolis. They built structures and buildings and then took over some of those costs. So there's a way to do it through the, the Superfund program. Closed landfill is a little different, and uh, we do have to look and see how that's yeah. done because the, the difference there is, uh, you know, we in law we have that ongoing responsibility for it. So it, it comes down to, and that was a negotiation on who covered what costs. <laughs> and and that's um, a part of what we need to do here, and, and that's where one of the challenges is, um, you know, not knowing what the true cost is, mm -hmm. and and it's also to any third party developer unfair for one of them to show their hand on what they can do it for, and then everyone else can go well. Now I know what their bid is, yeah. and so how do we do that in a way to protect someone who's done a lot of homework? And is the reason that the, the state may open up this policy to other places to do it. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge we have to try to solve. I, we think there might be paths um, to it. That's it. The, the other one is just the size of the, the cost. Yeah. I mean, the, awesome. the most expensive landfill that we've done before would have been the Washington County where we did the um, digging line in place, and that was 25 to $30 million. And so that's just the the difference in scope and and i know i've been working on this for many years with with your um staff here and and the cost has just gone up i mean it, it's gone up tens of millions of dollars already since when we first started working on this so um and part of that is because of time but part is we learn more about there's m more in there 
Um, five years ago, 1,4 docks and PFAS were really not on our, our radar for these types of facilities, and they are now. And just that extra, how to handle that adds costs, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Follow yeah. um, no. Can you flip back to your chart on um, the chemicals that were found? Because you, you listed them, but you didn't necessarily elaborate on what's the, the levels and were the levels, you know, put to a scale of parts per billion, whatever that might be. So are these dangerous levels? Are they trace levels that are below, uh, you know, any sort of human hazard based on everything we know today? Well, I, I'll just start with when we talk about health values, that's the Department of Health's value for drinking water consumption. And so if it was found in a private well or a public well, they would issue a well advisory. And so those chemicals uh, up there were found above that in the groundwater below the, the landfill, not in the drinking water of the, the city. And so in terms of orders of magnitude... Uh, I'd have to look into yeah. that, yeah. But, but I can provide that. Thank you. The reason I bring it up is that's a scary chart, right? That, that, that's enough to get people's attention. Certainly it'll get the news attention that's sitting here. But I want to deal with facts mm -hmm. and not just... Yeah a list of scary chemicals that uh, can create uh, some fear. And, and I certainly don't, none of us want to be another Cottage Grove or down the line when <clears throat> the 3M contamination uh, finally came to light and uh, the mayor of Cottage Grove was given a phone call, you know, stop all drinking water out of your wells immediately uh, and given very little notice. You know, we're, we are very diligent about monitoring and managing and making sure that we avoid any kind of uh, issue. And I think every one of us is working toward that, just as your agency always does. Um, but that that particular chart caused me some concern because, you know, you're, th those are, those are, you know, to the average person watching this replay, you know, every day on the hour pretty much for the next few months, <clears throat> so you can tune in. Um, you know, those types of things, need to have some context as to what they mean and what level of uh, potential uh, water uh, infiltration that they could pose. So I, I just hate to see it just listed there, this is what we found, and not any further elaboration on that it in fact is or is not uh, any type of uh, groundwater um, concern at this time. Um, and I think you, you made that clear and I believe Ryan Thank you for raising your hand and saying, uh, let's, let's be clear about this. Um, these are the things that may come into play, could come into play, at a time when Kramer uh, Mining and Materials is done pumping, or some pumping water out, and the lake fills up. Then these become a potential concern that, at that time. Today they are not. Is that a fair and accurate statement? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, they, your other chart where you showed sort of that, that, that future leakage, you know, it started in the red areas and then you said over time, there you go. Um, does that estimated area of groundwater impacts, does that forecast come from your, you know, existing historical experience in situations like this um, around the country? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around how does that sort of forecast come about? You know, I mean, what, what facts are behind it? Because, I, I, again, I want to make sure that we're dealing with facts all the way down the line when we're talking about this entire project because it's very, very important because we are talking about ground, groundwater, right? And I want to make sure that the public gets it uh, very clearly where this science comes from. If you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on that. <clears throat> so we, back in 2015, we hired a consultant um, to look at the data that we had out at the freeway landfill um, site, and they put it into a computer model, and it's a groundwater flow and a contaminant transport model. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they completed that model, and then as geologists and hydrogeologists, they then interpret that model and come up with their, their final predicted future values. And that, uh, the depth of that, if you could just touch on the, the depth of that, are you talking all the way down to the aquifer or at a, at a higher level this, where it would have to bleachate down further? I mean, can you sort of give yep. a little bit of an elevation? Yep, so elevation-wise, the waste is above the bedrock. 
Um, so within the months after pumping ceases, which is what this depiction, um, this model is predicting, the, the contamination starts emanating both horizontally, so that's what the yellow area is showing, but it also then starts transporting vertically too, so downward. Gotcha. And just a little bit on the contractor, it's Bar Engineering, and one of the reasons we pick them is because of the extensive work they've done in this region and know in the models they already had built for this area so that we um, had someone familiar with the location and the unique hydrology in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other comments? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirk and Jamie, for coming in. And I know it's good information for us, and it's good information uh, for Kramer Mine and Material and for Waste Management, and I'm sure for Mr. McGowan and, and his son Richard, who are present here also. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. And thank you to the folks from the MPCA for coming in. And I believe that uh, we have another piece that, Mr. Benke, you're going to be presenting. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Dave Benke. I'm the Director of the Resource Management <coughs> Assistance Division uh, at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Long, long title for <laughs> a lot of work that we do. And one of the things that we do is uh, the solid waste work um, at the agency. And so what I wanted to walk you through a little bit tonight was um, the statutes and the policies and the process basically to get waste certified so that we can develop uh, facilities to manage it uh, like landfills. And so if I'm going too fast and it feels like you're drinking out of a fire hose, I've been doing this for 30 years and so just ask questions or clarifications. The first, uh, this one here. On the right. Oh, perfect. Now we're technologically connected. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is just a little bit about the planning and work that goes into determining what amount of waste needs to be landfilled. Um, we call the uh, opposite of landfilling landfill abatement. And it took me a while to get used to that terminology, but all the things that the policies in the state are designed to do is to avoid landfilling. We know, as Kirk pointed out in an earlier slide, that managing waste uh, by preventing it or by managing it uh, is much better than having to clean it up or even having to put it into a landfill uh, and lose resources that we could use. So the whole idea is to manage things the best way we can and to avoid wasting resources. We recognize, though, that landfills are part of the system, and so we're going to need those at least for the foreseeable future, but how we get to determining how much we need is a process that's, that's laid out in statute. The statutes that govern waste are, are uh, found in 115A and 473, and they're two different sets of statutes because they govern the counties in the state who are responsible for waste management a little bit different. The greater Minnesota counties are generally found in 115A, and the metro counties are in 473. So the, la the legislature sets up the goals that we want to have for landfill abatement. We set up the goals that we want to do for recycling, how we want to manage has household hazardous waste, problem materials, how we want to recover energy, uh, and finally, what we want to do with the waste at the end and how we want to landfill it. So we're set up to develop a master plan um, that the Metro put, that the PCA puts together for all seven counties in the metro area. And we determine that as somewhat of a roadmap for how the waste will be managed. Each one of the metro counties then creates its own master plan to set out the implementation of the programs in the specific county. And so all seven counties are looking at that roadmap and determining what's needed. The, uh, our solid waste plan shows that we need to reduce the MSW that we've created. Um, the next slide you'll see is a look at what we've done with the system over the last 30 years or so. Um, we have made good progress in managing the waste from predominantly land disposal system to one that manages according to the characteristics of the waste and what can be recovered. Recyclables, organic material, energy are all part of that system now. And so as we look at that, we want to make sure that we can uh, manage the waste to recover things uh, and avoid that landfilling. 
If we look at the um, processes that we use, one of the things that the process to determine that is called a certificate of need. And that's outlined in the same statutes for the metro area in 473.23. And really what it does is, is basically says that we can't issue any new capacity unless it's been certified as needed. And so what we really do with that is if, if we take, took a look at the process, you take a look at those plans and you take the waste and you dump it through the plan. And the plan would have sieves in it, basically, that would say recycling gets pulled out so much, household hazardous waste so much. So I walked around the building. There are places you can put your organics. You can get syringes. You can get your pharmaceuticals all over. So all those wastes are not going to get disposed of in the landfill. And the reason for that is that they can potentially cause issues there, and we want to keep them out. Um, or they represent resources that we want to recover. So the plan basically sets up the amount of waste that we need to look at for landfilling. As I said, the agency adopts the Metro Solid Waste Plan, the counties follow those plans, and then that need is determined uh, after those plans are approved. If there is a need for a new permitted landfill, a certificate of need would be requested, and for the most part, that's done by the landfill company. Uh, in some cases, and especially in greater Minnesota, the counties own the landfills, and so it kind of connects the two. Um, and we look for those applications to see how much is necessary. Once a certificate of need is granted, we can issue a permit based on that amount. So the permit application kind of helps us understand how much is going to be needed at the facility um, based on that certificate of need. But it also may trigger if we need to do any environmental review. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's the assessment of what impacts we might have with that facility. Each permit is for a 10-year period, so we look at the certificate of need to match up with that 10-year period uh, based on those plans. So if you think about the certificate of need, it's really based off of the plans. The plans determine that, and at the end, we look at what's um, needed for that. In the metro area, we have another uh, statute uh, that says there's a restriction on disposal of all waste, recognizing that we want to make sure that we don't put waste in the land. The restriction on disposal makes sure that our resource recovery facilities are full before we issue the um, certificate of need or um, certify that the waste would be suitable for landfilling. So it's just another piece to kind of check on that. Um, all of these things work together to make sure that we're not wasting opportunities. But also, once we do issue a permit to a landfill, we know that it will have the resources to cover the costs that uh, it needs. As we learned in, in the discussion earlier, if the landfills don't have the right resources to uh, line, manage, leachate, um, cover, uh, then the resources aren't there for necessarily to handle those costs. And we get stuck with something that someone else will have to pick up the tab for. And so that's really important that we make sure once we do have a permit issued that the waste will go there and that it'll be able to cover those costs. So there's a deliberate planning on both ends, keeping waste out of landfills, but once we have landfills, we want to make sure that they're fully utilized. The restriction on disposal really is another piece that uh, plays into it in terms of um, we've created a system where we want to manage waste uh, and recover resources from it. And waste energy is one of those ways to recover those resources from it. And so we want to make sure that no waste is disposed of unless it has to be. So any waste that is generated in the metro area has to kind of pass that test. Is there a facility available to take it? If not, it needs to be certified that it is unprocessable and then it can go to the landfill. But if there's a facility that's capable of taking it, um, we want to make sure those are full before we dispose of that. You know, when we talk about waste, and I probably should have said it to start with, mixed municipal solid waste is what we're talking about here. It doesn't include industrial waste or commercial or construction and demolition material, mining waste or those kind of things. So it's the garbage that you have at your household that you probably put out the curb 
if it was a collection day like mine in the, at my house today. So the other thing I mentioned was the environmental review. Um, that's a process to make sure that the facilities uh, are looked at holistically, not just from the permitting standpoint, but to look at them from all environmental Im impacts that they might have. And determine that if uh, there are impacts, how can we mitigate those either through permitting actions uh, or through some other alternatives. Back in 2004, 2005, there was an environmental impact statement that was done for the Burnsville landfill. Uh, and so if we needed to do one on that, we would do what's called a supplemental environmental impact statement, where we take the bulk of the information that's there and take a look at it and scope any other information that we needed to update or to look at for the facility. Um, we would draft up a decision document on that um, and then put that out for public notice uh, and get input from uh, the public on that. Um, once we uh, got the input and had drafted the supplemental, we would look at it for its adequacy to make sure that the environmental protections were there for the facility. And then we would make a determination from that. So the last piece, if you follow through that, the planning happens, then the certificate of need process happens. If there's an environmental review required, uh, that happens, and then finally you would do permitting. Now, it's not a linear process. We can do a lot of these things side by side. Um, the permitting process usually has to start with an application so we can look at those other issues based off of that. Environmental review really looks at an application, so you want a project to be known. But the permitting process starts with that submittal of the application. Um, once we determine that uh, it's adequate, we can draft a permit. Uh, we can put that out for public notice and get comments. Um, and then based on the comments uh, and addressing those comments, then we would determine uh, if we could issue that permit. And so that's really a short version of what happens. Um, but in most cases, um, you know, the application process, the certificate of need, uh, and environmental review can be conducted on a simultaneous process, but the decisions have to follow in a certain order. Once the environmental review is done and the decision is made, then the other items can actually be decided. So the certificate of need can't be issued until the environmental review is done. There's also a bill, uh, legislative uh, statute that was changed a couple of years back to require the, um, the uh, local unit of government, uh, be that a city or a county, uh, who has jurisdiction over a facility uh, to make their decision first uh, unless they want to defer to the agency to issue a permit. We want to make sure that the, the local unit of government uh, makes their decision uh, before we proceed. And one of the reasons was just not to put pressure on the local unit of government saying the agency is issuing the permit, therefore everyone should follow suit. We want to make sure that that's, that's a process that the local unit of government has a a chance at first. Um, so after that deferral uh, or decision is made, then we can issue the, the permit. Um, we would issue that along with the findings of fact that goes along with those in our determinations, and the permit would then be issued. So that is kind of in a nutshell the process, and I'm sure I was talking faster than you wanted, but um, if there are questions, I can try and address those for you. Questions for... Mr. Benke. Yes, Vince. How, how much does local approval have? I guess I understood this process a little differently, where local approval needed to precede the CON. Does that have an impact on your certificate of need process? The certificate of need process, um, I don't think that there's a requirement that the local approval is done. The certificate of need you know, can't get used without a permit issue. And so the local approval of a permit or a conditional use permit or something, um, it could still precede that, but it wouldn't be issued until the actual permit would never get issued if the local uh, decision was not to go with the facility. And then once in this process, is there wiggle room for it to be approved or not approved? Um, Ultimately, 
I mean, if you've gotten halfway through the process, say with this BSLI application, um, is it fairly likely that if all the boxes are being checked off, that things go as expected? Or are there outside variables within the EIS and EAW that could kick that? The environmental review takes a look at a lot of different elements associated with the project. And so I think if those, you know, it's not a decision-making uh, document of its own. It's an informing document for those other permit processes. So if a, you know, if all the boxes were being checked and everything looked good on the environmental review, then I would say the permit should follow. Um, but if there were issues raised in the environmental review that couldn't be addressed by a permit condition or a change in the uh, project, then it would be a much tougher job to, to issue that permit based on uh, there still being issues that needed to be mitigated. Yeah. I think uh, perhaps one of the things that we're doing and probably what you're getting at, Vince, is uh, we do a concept, Jenny, we do a concept approval that signals the MPCA that we have looked at it hmm. so that they proceed with their work to do the evaluation uh, and to get to the point where they can say, yes, they can issue a, a, con uh, a conditional, uh, a certificate of need. But if through that process there are conditions that are realized, then we don't have to move forward with that because ours is conceptual. It's a conceptual approval. Jenny? That's correct, Madam Mayor. Yeah. So, and that's the way you, that's the process when we, we look at that statute. Correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it, what's going to be coming before us is conceptual so that they can move forward with the, con, with the certificate of need process. Okay, is this, yeah. Dan. Uh, a couple of questions. <clears throat> How many times has Burnsville Sanitary Landfill submitted a certificate of need to the MPCA over the years? And how many have been approved or rejected? Do you have any idea? Offhand, I'm not, I don't have those in front of me, but they have uh, been continually permitted. The, the one thing that has changed over time is the certificate of need uh, statute didn't happen at the same time the initial permitting statutes happened. So a lot of the facilities that were initially permitted were permitted with design capacity. Um, and once that ran out, then a certificate of need would need to be requested. Um, I can get back to you on the exact numbers on that in terms of how many times, but I don't have that right in front of me. Thank you. Um, with Great River Energy closed, uh, how much capacity did the Metro lose when that shut down for processing? So yeah, back roughly. to how the waste is managed in the Metro on the slide, um, the Great River Energy facility was a considerable uh, part of the system. Um, Very much they so. managed approximately 300,000 tons per year with a capacity to manage more. Uh, it varied a little bit from year to year, but that's generally the number that we look at. Um, right now, they're going through, um, you know, the actual Great River Energy uh, folks have closed the doors on accepting waste and burning waste, but they're looking to uh, sell the facilities. And so right now, we're evaluating what that impact will be long term. Uh, and once that's known, then we'll have to factor that into our certificate of need and planning processes and so forth. It, was it that 300? number that you referred to what percentage of the metro did that roughly represent i mean is it 10 percent or 40 percent or i mean that's of a, the it's waste a lot. that was <laughs> of sent to resource recovery facilities it probably represented about uh, 30 percent maybe 40 in oh. terms of that's so it was a considerable amount that um but that's not all the waste that we manage a lot of the waste we manage goes to recycling and goes mm -hmm. to organics um, so of that uh, Thirty percent, probably ten percent of what was managed at resource recovery facilities would have been managed there. And how was the how is that being dealt? When you lose that kind of capacity, what's that mean to all the other places where uh, you know where's that all being diverted to, and how is that being handled? And how does that change? I suppose the 
um, you know, your planning? The planning changes, I think, it changes quite a bit in terms of what we need to take a look at. Uh, it's a big change in terms of the system, and we've got to take a look at how that impacts things. And we also have to take a look at where is that going to. Uh, the other resource recovery facilities, if they continue to be full, um, and is it going to other landfills, and, and where is that you know, the pressure being put on? Um, and I think that's going to come back to our discussions about certificate of need when we get to that point after the final disposition of that facility. What are we going to need to do there? Any system addition, whether it be a landfill, a resource recovery facility, mm -hmm. takes time for development. <coughs> um, but we also want to do it, as I mentioned before, in a deliberate fashion so that we have that to rely on longer term. Uh, so even though you know Great River Energy closed, it closed after operating for 20 plus years and managing waste there. So it was counted on for a long time. Absolutely. Uh, we so we'll see those numbers through our reporting and through the counties as we, we don't get information exactly where it's going. We'll see that after the fact as we get our um, reports on what facilities are accepting it. Just a little bit more on the amount of waste. When you think of what's accepted here at Burnsville, it was more waste going to uh, GRE than is going to Burnsville mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. just to give you some type of context that you're mm -hmm. familiar with. Right. That's, that's a lot. Right? Yeah. Um, reminds me, uh, Mayor and I were in uh, Kansas City last year in the spring and, and uh, saw a presentation from, uh, I believe it was a Republic that was talking about recycling and when China went from 3% yeah. uh, to a half yeah. percent contamination, it basically shut down yeah. our export of recyclables to China and, and the images of uh, the, uh, the haulers uh, facilities overwhelmed with, um, with recycling. I mean, so I, I think of that when I think mm -hmm. of Great River shutting down and 30 to 40 percent, um, where's it all suddenly going, right? Because it was going there, now where's it all uh, deferring to? So I appreciate your your comment related to the certificate of need. I mean, we're reviewing it. It's in for a PUD re review right now, and we've had a lot of discussions about it, and um, I'm not even interested in the, uh, the host fee revenue side per se. It's really about, um, you know, having DEMCON cells open for 100 and 60 years or so, as opposed to filling those cells up with solid municipal waste in a much shorter time than 165 years. And of course, it, it relates to the, 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 the plan B, I'll call it, for uh, the freeway landfill and providing a, a location for that garbage to go, which helps Burnsville Sanitary Landfill uh, fill up earlier and close earlier. Um, and so there's all types of wins uh, to be able to allow that. So we're, we're, I'm hoping that we push that through our process and give our concept approval so we can turn it over to you for a certificate of need and, and the next steps down the line as quickly as possible because uh, you're, I'm sure you're fully aware that BSLI is running out of space for solid municipal waste and that's going to mean um, problems for them, problems for the city, for the county uh, in host fee revenue. So that's beside the point. I think the bigger picture is uh, getting it done and um, fixing what is, you know, what was years ago a different plan with the amount of DEMCON that they set up for. They're just not getting that, and uh, they're not going to get it for a long time. So we'd rather see those cells um, and, and things change to, to handle the solid municipal waste. So I, my final word is I just hope that you'll support it, and I think there's a few factors, Great River Energy, that are coming into play that may uh, make it a good decision. Uh, to do that, so hopefully you will. Thank you. Yes, Kirk. So one piece, you mentioned the freeways uh, and the big in hall option and connected to yeah. the certificate of need. Mm -hmm. um, it is a separate piece here. We've yeah. already made a de determination that it's basically a landfill to landfill transfer, and so that waste would not need a certificate of that's need. Right. So when we're looking at the certificate of need, we're thinking of new waste that's being generated mm -hmm. coming through yes. the process. So we just want to <clears throat> decouple those two items. Yeah. We've seen it reported sometimes as being one. Yeah. Yep. They just need the capacity to be able to yeah. take So it. what everybody also need to know is that uh, that um, because uh, Waste Management spoke to this, that it's not just a certificate of need, but I believe, um, Mike, that you're also <coughs> going to have to look at the uh, 
Corps of Engineer and the um, uh, Department of Natural Resources and get permits from them. So you have to go through their process as well. We do. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So all of those things are all going to be going together. And you have to review all of that in terms of your uh, review for the certificate of need. Uh, the findings from both the Department of Natural Resources and the Corps of Engineer. Madam Chair, the, or Mayor, the, the, I think the main review that we would do that would be with the environmental review portion okay. of that, the that's process. Okay, that's in the supplemental. Yeah. Okay. Supplemental would then come before your process is completed. Right. It, so, as I mentioned, there's yeah. some parallel yeah. process that we yeah. can run at the same time. Yeah. But in terms of decision making, yeah. it's that order that the environmental review comes first. Yeah. At the certificate of need and local approval, and finally our yeah. permit. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Thank you. Great information. Thank you. Uh, and it helps us. Also helps our neighbors from the north to have good information. And also, I know our neighbors in Savage are also very interested in this whole process. So thank you very much. Okay. And I think, uh, yeah, and I'm going to see, is, does anyone want to ask any questions or of the presentation, any comments, or is this an education kind of thing that we're all gathered here tonight? Okay, I see the heads nodding that it's all education. Okay. Okay, we're all, so we're all here listening to the same information. It's on TV, it's web streamed, you can listen to it when you go back and uh, gather any more information that you might need. And of course, all of you are working with Kirk and his team at the MPCA. So we'll go forth with that. And Mike and Richard, thank you for coming in. And Liz and George, thank you. I still may have a comment later if I may, Mayor. Absolutely. Thank you. I always, you no always have that, Thank you. Mike. You know, every time you come, I always ask, do you want to speak? And you always say, I will choose my time. Thank you very much. And when you choose your time, you will have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. We'll move on. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here. And we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. And this is the policy amendment regarding street and utility improvements in southwest Burnsville. And uh, John, you're up. There may be an audience out there. She's doing the name switch. Yeah, I know. Uh, okay, <laughs> like here's what we're going to do. We are going to recess for five minutes as we transition yeah, the room. Right. Good call. Okay.
distracted to get my presentation up. She said it was casual. <laughs> there we go. There. All right. So, uh, first uh, timeline of events that gets us to today. I won't go through all of this, but uh, just to get everybody up to speed, Southwest Burnsville uh, was originally constructed years ago with gravel streets. Um, in the 80s into the early 90s, many of those streets were paved and assessed 100% to the residents. Um, in the early 90s, the city did a study of the area to see uh, what the area might look like in the future. Um, if sewer and water were extended and that there were redevelopment and new smaller lots. And uh, at that time, the residents were concerned about the impact that uh, those improvements could have to their neighborhood. So the city enacted a policy that stated that uh, street and utility improvements uh, in the area would require a petition from the residents and 100% of the cost bared by them if there were improvements made. Uh, except for street improvements on collector level roadways, the city could initiate improvements and assess for those improvements. Uh, prior to 2017, we were starting to notice uh, deteriorating local streets, um, and we started to look at uh, how we could address those. Um, at the January uh, count 2017 of all day work session this was brought up um, and we were directed as staff to start looking into how to address this uh, since there's been a number of uh, work sessions and open houses um, it's in the background um, there the most recent open house was held on October 10th and then uh, we went to the December 18th meeting to try to get an updated policy adopted and that was continued due to some lingering concerns about part of our proposed policy amendments. Uh, the policy amendments that we wanted to make are to allow city initiated in-kind street improvements for local roads, uh, assess 40% of the project costs for those street improvements uh, to the residents, and then to specify a per unit assessment methodology. Um, as I've talked about at previous meetings, uh, the per unit assessment methodology pretty much operates on the premise that the special benefit to the properties is proportional to the, um, to the existing and potential developable lots uh, that could be realized in the area. So, if a lot uh, appears to be splittable, we feel that there's a proportional benefit to that potential future lot. To determine uh, the accessible units, staff did a desktop analysis to see um, which parcels we think could be split based on current city code. Uh, uh, based on current city code, there's several, uh, a number of ways that uh, or conditions you have to meet in order to be able to split. One is you have to be able to provide two acres of dry buildable land per lot. Uh, secondly, you have to have at least 200 feet of frontage for each buildable lot. And then you need to be able to build on those lots while meeting setbacks. And then lastly, for each lot, you have to be able to provide a viable primary and alternate septic area. Uh, all, most of these things could be uh, investigated with a desktop analysis. The one thing that we weren't able to look at is to prove that each lot would have a, a viable primary and alternate septic area that would require soils testing, and that's outside of the scope of what we would do as city staff. So again, the, the premise of this methodology is that the special benefit derived by the parcels is proportional to their number of, put, of existing or potential future lots. And um, one of the key things that came up in, as concerns before is this, uh, there's the two acres dry buildable land, but there's also the 200 feet of frontage. So there are some parcels uh, that are larger in the Southwest Burnsville area that they may have enough land area to meet multiple more units for on the two acre dry buildable but they're limited by the street frontage 
and the we feel that the benefit to those prayer souls is limited to that uh, that they get from the roads we're improving. So if they were to be add more roads in the future to be able to split further, we don't see how we can prove benefit to those added parcels. But we do uh, feel that we can prove benefit to the ones that have street frontage provided by the roads we're improving. I didn't make that very clear at the December meeting, and I wanted to emphasize that. So next, uh, this is a map, albeit a little hard to read, that shows, based on our desktop analysis, um, how many units each parcel we would propose to be assessed for. Uh, most of them are in green, and that just means that those parcels, we would only propose one unit assessment. Uh, the blue parcels are ones that we would propose a two-unit assessment, and then the red parcels are ones we would propose a three-unit assessment. At the December meeting, uh, we continue to have support for updating the policy to allow us to initiate local road improvements and to assess those at 40 percent. But there were some concerns brought up uh, regarding the proposed assessment methodology. And um, it's in the background, but um, I'll just talk about them. First, um, there was concern that parcels proposed for assessment of more than one unit there's no guarantee that they'll be splittable in the future. We think there's a strong likelihood, uh, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and to prove that a parcel wouldn't be able to be split would cost money with soils testing and uh, analysis of the septic viability. Second uh, concern was brought up that uh, parcels proposed for assessment of more than one unit um, still generate the same amount of traffic because currently they only have, say, one homestead. Uh, but our response would be that assessments are not directly, directly related to traffic generation. Uh, there is the, uh, the actual street frontage. Uh, larger frontage parcels have more curb appeal. They have more maybe potential parking, that sort of thing. So. Special benefit is not directly related to traffic. That's just one piece of how you would look at how the parcel is going to benefit. Um, third, there was a concern brought up that we should that or the suggestion made that we shouldn't look at the frontage requirement and only look at the two acre dry buildable. And uh, as I stated earlier, uh, we don't feel that we can prove benefit to parcel additional parcels or additional lots that could be added that require addition of more streets. So we can only prove benefit to the to the lots that are using the access of our existing streets and that we provided sufficient frontage for. For um, so that was a few concerns that were brought up. And the item was continued so that we could discuss the assessment portion of the policy further. And we uh, discussed a number of those concerns with our city attorney. There were other things brought up, like can you uh, relate assessments to, to uh, market value? There were things like could we use other methods, uh, things like that. And after discussing it with our attorney, we pretty much settled on two options to present to council. And the first would be to move forward assessing on a per unit basis as presented at the December meeting, which would mean uh, the assessable units, they'd be assessed um, up front. Uh, the, the people who will have parcels with more than one unit would just be required to pay those units up front or put them on their taxes over a period of years. Um, that's the original proposal, and uh, that's the option one in your background. Option two would be to assess on a per unit basis with the same methodology, but for those parcels that have more than one unit proposed, we would assess the first unit up front and we would propose deferring the remaining units. And with that, we would propose that the deferment be for 15 years 
and that if a lot does not or a parcel doesn't split into multiple lots within that 15 year period the the assessment that was deferred would just go away uh, if they were to split within that 15 year period the assessment uh, would become payable um, and then a key item with that would be if you went with the deferment option, we propose that the deferred units would not accrue interest until they become payable. So when they become payable in the future, if a parcel splits, uh, those deferred units would become payable. Uh, the owner could either pay those in full at that time or could let them go on their taxes over a period of years consistent with our current city policy. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is we're proposing this 15-year deferment because that actually matches a couple of different things. One, it's the maximum term we would even allow a repayment of a res an assessment. But also, uh, these road improvements do have limited life, so as staff, we feel that after 15 years, the useful life has diminished. And that that would no longer we could no longer prove benefit after that point, and that's why we're proposing that. Um, if you go based on uh, past legal precedent, would say that if we didn't specify that, that it would go 30 years, mm -hmm. is kind of the generally mm -hmm. accepted uh, term before those assessments, deferred assessments, would go away. Um, if the city were to go with the deferment option, there would be money to backfill because there would be some units that um, may never become payable. And if, even if all of the units for the two proposed projects we have over the next five years, even if all those deferred units were to never become payable, the cost to the city would be approximately $25,000. And uh, that's on about $1.5 million worth of projects. So it would be some cost borne by the city if we did the deferment option. Um, in the background, I did kind of lay out a couple, some pros and cons for each option. For the option one, where we just assess all the units up front and don't defer any of them, uh, the, the pros to that would be city staff would not have to flag these lots and keep track of when they split. We could just collect the money um, and it would be less bookkeeping. The disadvantage of the option one though is that if a parcel owner never splits their parcel, um, they would have still paid for multiple units. So also um, to get out of paying those multiple units, they would need to uh, do a soils testing to prove that they wouldn't be splittable and that would be a cost to the resident and there we would not reimburse that cost if they wanted to try to prove that they are not splittable. Uh, if we go with option two, uh, the pros of that are if somebody doesn't split in the future then they wouldn't pay the deferred units uh, so they don't have to prove to us they're not splittable. Um, also, um, we would, uh, 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 there are cons to that though too. The cons would be we would have to keep track of this in our records so we know when a parcel goes to split to look up and figure out what they should owe on an assessment. And then um, that's, that's really kind of the main pros and cons to that one. Um, so what we're looking for is direction from council on how you would want us to update the policy. Uh, what we're looking to do is get direction from you tonight, update the policy, and bring it back as a consent agenda item at the February 19th meeting. Okay, very good. So before we answer your question, we have uh, uh, our citizens who want to speak. Mr. Callahan. Yes, please come to the table. <coughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, what you asked for is one of the proposals tonight. Yes, and I'm and very I bet you you like that, and I, I think Mr. Meyer is going to like that, too. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member, Workman, nice to see you. Dana Dan, Kara. Um, it, it makes sense to me because we don't have to put the burden of proof on either the city or the residents to determine developability. Mm -hmm. We just deal with reality. Um, one way to mitigate the concern about record keeping going forward 
if a house gets built in southwest Burnsville, charge it because that's all you have to do. If there are any additional houses, they're going to end up on these additional lots. Yeah. So. Yeah, it can go on a lien also of yeah. the property. So right. just like any real estate transaction. So well, as part of the. You're going to end up having to file all kinds of paperwork yeah. and stuff on the survey and go to the county and I all that other stuff. I think there are models stuff. out there that we can take a look at. So, yeah. but you like the deferred? Yes, okay. please. I okay. would like the approved. Okay. And I so appreciate let's your see, Mr. Meyer, you like the deferred or you, you want to speak also? <laughs> you only want to pay for your unit right now, not the, the possibility of a, of a second unit. Yeah, thank you. Right? Um, Merle Meyer, we live on uh, 3113 Loop Road. Yeah. Um, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members, thank you for allowing us to, to uh, speak. Um, also, I want to thank you for um, listening to our concerns yeah. at the December Council meeting yeah. and taking the time and effort to, to you know, consider the alternatives. Yeah. Um, from an initial uh, perspective, um, it, it, it appears that you, you answered our, our questions. Um, because one of the questions we had was had to do with if it was never split, mm -hmm. and that and that part's deferred. Uh, I guess the the one thing that that I do uh, have some concerns about is that um, it, even you know to, today we have a for us we we have one property that was determined to be splittable, and and. You know, we, we have no plans to divide our property um, any time in the near future. Uh, but, you know, it, it may be that, that we, um, we might want to do it at some time in the future, and, and we would pay at that time. But, but even if we didn't develop it, we just split it and didn't develop it. Um, I'm just wondering if, there's, if that's a, even a fair payment, that, you know, uh, Mr. Callahan suggested that it, it could be handled that if, if the property was ever improved beyond splitting, it could be paid at that time because then there is a real benefit uh, to the property owner. Um, and so that, I guess that was, that was one concern we had. So the only outstanding if you went ahead and split the property, your question is, will you but be... But that improved it, went, went ahead and improved it because even... Even today, if the, if if the property was we we split it at some time but never improved it, you know there really would, wouldn't be any additional benefit to us from from the improvements. The the, the benefit remains the same, regardless. I think it's about when you build on it. Probably is might be the trigger. So I, I, yeah. I agree. I think it's when you build on it. But when I, you build I, on I, it. I do have to ask you why would you split it if you don't plan to develop it? Yeah, why spend why, the money? What would be the purpose of it? It doesn't make sense. Well, maybe at some point in time in the future, let's say. So, you know, it, it, it could just potentially add value to a transaction later on. That, that, that would, you, that want, would, you want to split for, to sell it off? Yeah, so... If you sell it off, whoever buys it is going to end up paying it anyways. Well, somebody, you know, yeah, somebody at some point in time. I'm, I'm, it's just a... Just when, when you look at it from a transactional perspective, there's a, there's a potential of doing it. You know, gaining yeah. more value from your property in the future. That's sure. that. That would be the only reason. Because it gets expensive to keep replatting all those. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I, that's why I'm asking. I, I understand why would you do that, that part. Yeah. Develop? It, it just yeah. as you know, as yeah, a potential. You might want to just split it when you're wanting to. Right. Yeah, I would wait. To I, I would wait and say you'll split it when you want to sell it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just making the comment. Yeah. The, the, the other side is um, the other comment that that we have is is towards value. Um, you know, we, we have something under five acres of land, and somebody ac across the road has two acres of land, um, and, and there's, there's supposed to be a, a value to this improvement. And I guess the question we have is, is do we, are we really receiving a greater value? So, so let's, if we look at the, the, uh, the dollar amounts, uh, the, the proposed Im improvement for back on Loop Road would essentially be $3,100 per unit. And so, and so, and so I ask, you know, would ask the question that, you know, 
by putting that improvement by, in real terms, are we getting $6,100 worth of value versus the person across the street only receiving $3,100 worth of value on, on the property. I guess that's a, I guess that's just the other, the other piece of it because. Well, it, throughout it, the whole city, it's a 60-40 split. Mm -hmm. Right, no, I And so I understand. the same question in terms of value mm -hmm. uh, for 10,000 uh, foot lots. And some lots are even larger than that. Um, and that's it, to try and look at things and say, you have, because you have five acres and the other do you, what's the value? I think we are looking at it. So Ryan and John, it's how we look at the split. So 60% is paid by all of the citizens of Burnsville. Mm -hmm. they, they put into uh, the fund and also through the taxes. The 40% is the assessment for the benefiting property owners. So, Ryan. Okay. We're, we're proposing to go with units as opposed to footage out That's here because right. there's so much irregularity. Mm -hmm. So in general, right. in general, the ones with more units also have more footage. Yeah. If the city attorney was here, he would tell you that the amount of frontage that a lot has um, is more impacted by the street. So yeah. if there's more street being improved in front of it. So. Like I said, we know there's lots out here that don't have a lot more frontage than yours, but do have a lot more area. So, I mean, I'm, we're taking that into account. But that's and, the, and if I might add, so we did do some looking at some other methods, like, okay, the frontage method is pretty simple to see. Um, and I'll bring up the map. I guess not yeah. so simple from my angle. But uh, there is a wide variation in frontages. So if we were to go by frontage, there'd be uh, widely varying assessments, which would violate yeah. the uh, uniformity rules on type mm -hmm. and class. Uh, another option would be, well, do you do land area? Well, same problem. You get large, some really big parcels, and then small ones. So if we proportioned it to that, that's not really fair based on type and class or yeah. uniform. So the per unit method kind of gives us a way to mm -hmm. sort of take a little bit of both and sort of account for the fact that the larger parcels have more benefit, derive more benefit from the improvement. Mm -hmm. Now, is it perfect? Is it the perfect method? No assessment method is perfect. Um, so we did look at those some other options, and that's why the reason we're recommending the per unit is we feel that it gives us a way to, to estimate the benefit and proportion it. Um, yeah. Really, so that like uh, the one acre parcels that do have a homestead that are grandfathered in, that they're not bearing the cost of the larger yeah. lots. Mm -hmm. But I do understand this is not yeah. a perfect method. No, it's like the front footage. When we look at front footage and people would say, well, I've got a corner lot. Yeah. Acknowledging that that would be my scenario on yeah. a corner lot. A corner. <laughs> yeah. So, and they say, why am I paying more than my neighbor across the street? Agreed. That's not. Yeah. We've heard yeah. that argument many, many times yeah. in here. Huh? Many times. So, but what we're, we're proposing is a deferment, which is what you wanted. Uh, and so, and a per unit. Sure. So, I hope that's agreeable with you. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, council, direction to staff. Oh, uh, Ryan? Jim may have a couple comments on um, building permit versus uh, slot split. Yeah, so um, yeah. I, in my experience with special assessments, um, I've talked to some appraisers and they indicate that the special benefit goes to the land and not to the That's building. That's right. And so when you subdivide, it makes sense to collect at the subdivision point. Record keeping wise, yeah. as well as the benefit will be had, realized with the, with the subdivision. Yeah. Good. Dan? I was going to say, we, we have precedence for this anyways. Absolutely. Early on in the city life, uh, yeah. lots of land wasn't platted. Uh, we deferred uh, park yeah. dedication and all kinds of different things. And as they started bringing it online for development, that's when all those fees started being collected. Yeah. So it, there's a precedent for doing yeah. it. So deferment is what mm -hmm. I'm hearing from everybody. Yes. Yeah. Dan? Well, I just also want to comment on, I, I would go with number two, too. Um, I really enjoyed this process, getting the feedback yeah. from the residents of Southwest Burnsville, which they come yeah. in 
um, uh, every time we take up something related to that area and, um, and they show up, they speak, and they brought some very good options, and uh, we now have resolution, which uh, is, is in basically su universal support with a few points of non yeah. being not being perfect but um, I, I appreciate it. this is a yeah. this is the way I wish everything worked well we have done this Dan for 20 years and we have <coughs> arrived at resolution on any other and here tonight and so staff thank you very much and I think uh, council I'm seeing consensus to go with the deferment yes yeah. okay Ryan can I ask Clarification: If this yes. is deferment upon lot split or building permit, the staff recommendation would be upon lot split. Upon lot split. Yeah. Lot yeah. Split. yeah. Okay. Okay. Clear. Thank you. Okay. Really Thank you. Three now you got it. <laughs> yes. And so, Dan and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Meyer, we're going to continue to always. You've known we've always listened, and we've always come to a resolution. So thank you for being engaged. Can I say, yeah. Dan, I'm looking forward to see you in two years. I'm looking forward to see you again in two years. Out <laughs> of two years, I come in. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, Ryan and Jen, thank you so much for all of the, heart, the good work. Okay. Uh, roundtable. There is nothing on roundtable, so reports. Vince. Um, we have a board meeting for Fire Muster tomorrow, informal, and then open house is next month. Okay. That's it. Dan? Uh, Dakota Brab Band meets tomorrow, so I hope you get your speech out quick so I can run out of there to get over to the other one. And, yeah. and um, nothing else going on until the end of the month. So what do you want to do with the, the Community Foundation? Well, um, I, can, I, I think they're so going to change it back to Thursday again now. But if you want to be on it, you sh you're welcome to it. But, well, but no, I'll, but I I'll just wanted it. to make sure because you had – Mentioned yeah. it that you can't do both. So why don't well, they, we wait? They, uh, so we why had, don't we wait? Another email see. came out, and we're meeting actually on Thursday. Well, that was of because of Wednesday. Yeah. But I don't, but I don't know, know if, if they. I don't yeah. Know. I'll find out on Thursday. Why don't what you and I do. have a conversation okay. afterwards? We can do just that. so we can. Okay. We'll, we'll have coffee. <laughs> yeah, of yeah. course. Kara. Uh, DCC orientation on Friday. Okay. Dan. Uh, just a couple of items on our last fire muster board. Uh, Johnny Holmes was booked for Friday. It's pretty exciting. We got big, big act back. And there uh, is a brand new fire muster website that's going to go live very soon. Um, so just sorry, I meant to give you that. Stealing my thunder. Today, but I, just to see, I was going to see if you got these two items. <laughs> um, let's see. Boy, what did we have last time? Oops. Where did my. There we go. I-35, I think we covered that already. Oh no, actually uh, we met on, uh, I believe the I-35 met after the last mm -hmm. work session because of the way the, mm. the calendar lined up, is that true? Sounds right. I'm looking at my notes thinking, hmm, did I say these already at the last month's meeting? Techno committee met, consultation, project list was done. You had a big part, I feel like this is deja vu. Does that sound yeah. familiar? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, it's getting late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, MVTA. <clears throat> the, um, Just the highlights. <laughs> I've only got three bullet points. That's pretty pretty highlight. Um, the uh, MVTA board, I pass this around to everybody, mm -hmm. so this is really for public consumption. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of discussions at the state level, debates, on sick and safe leave. A leave, uh, paid parental leave. Yeah. The uh, MVTA staff got together and came up with a proposal. Um, it's not um, 12 weeks plus another 12 weeks. It's six weeks at 60% of their pay. Has no budget hit because no one's going to be replaced during that period. And they have an option of getting themselves back to 100% by using PTO or working remotely from home. Um, and it's uh, uh, specifically for uh, new children or adopted children in the family, and so uh, I thought it was a fantastic, uh, realistic, um, and employee uh, uh, brought forward idea. So uh, the board unanimously voted in favor of it, and I've circulated it to some organizations um, as some good examples of how a government agency of many cities 
and uh, staff can work together to come up with a, a good uh, paid parental leave that allows uh, new children, new babies, or adopted children in the family some, some bonding time. So that was a great idea. 2018 ridership results down 1.7. The expectation was 3% because of the 25 cent uh, fare increase, so we fared much better than what, pardon the pun, the fare was. Um, Southwest was actually down 2% and Metro Transit was down 4%. Uh, so uh, ridership in MBTA remains very strong by comparison. And we also handled Luther Widener, our uh, executive director, his annual review in a closed session. He got an exceptional review and a, uh, a good raise. So he's doing a great job. Thank okay. you. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Burnsville um, Convention and Visitors uh, Bureau meeting is at the end of the month, and I will complete that work there because I have to. I did the performance evaluation, all gathered all of that uh, data, and uh, will be submitting it to the board, and then also let them know that you're going to be there at uh, the next meeting because it's we'll now down to six. Too six meetings a year, so they'll be doing that. But I think one of the things, council members, that it's, it's not something I report on because it's a, um, uh, an organization that uh, I belong to, is Lions. Mm -hmm. Last night, we voted to give to the city for our parks program at Red Oak so that we can have some of the uh, amenities that are needed for our diverse needs of children from handicap and so forth, $140,000. Wow. Wow. From Lyons to the city of Burnsville, 70000 this year, and will 70000 next year. But if our, um, our finances and our revenues become stable towards, we will, we will uh, probably finish that up this year, but 140000 And I think it would be really nice, Melanie and Ryan, if uh, a, um, because it's new play opportunities for our children at Red Oak. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also for uh, handicapped children. So they're uh, on wheelchairs. They can play these different uh, um, activities. They're, I think the, the difficulty with the basketball rings go up in difficulty with all of the, the, the different play equipment that's going to be put in and also the flooring. So that's what drove it. But, you know, but for Lions, these extra wants wouldn't have been possible it, because we don't have it in our budget. But I think you all need to know that uh, and our staff does a great job of identifying these things and how we can do it, and then uh, our relationship uh, with our Lions Club. And they're so good to us. I mean, when you look at it, the Lions Play Park down at uh, Cliff Fen, mm -hmm. the Splash Pad, uh, the um, Skateboard Park, the Police Fire Range. I mean, I can go on and on about all of the things that we Lions have funded. So I just think that you all need to know. Do you have an idea over the years how much machine. that's been? And, uh, I mean, those are all major things in our city. All major and things. And if you want the dollar amount, I have it. Well, I'd, love, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> because it it is just extraordinary what yeah. Lions have done for our community. So, And not just our community, Savage, because it's Burnsville Lions, but we have a lot of savage members nice. so and the other thing is that we're starting our international festival um <laughs> fundraising so we're on the way for that and uh so that's coming up real good and the other thing is i think uh you should all be getting invitations for the 10th anniversary of the Ames center uh i think that's all coming out i i think it's either today or tomorrow that's coming out of out. Venue I think Works? Going out this, this week, yeah. Okay. And uh, I think um, that's that's it because the other meetings don't start till, and Melanie and I, our uh, MLC commission, that's quarterly. And um, so that's it. Don't you have a big speech tomorrow? 
And well, state speech, of the yeah. city is tomorrow, you guys. <laughs> yes. And we have a great state of the city. All I right. mean, looking to the future. And cocktails. And co yeah. <laughs> well, yes, so and hors d'oeuvres. Yes. Yeah. Pardon me? Three p.m. at the Three. Three p.m. Three p.m. State of the city. Three p.m. Okay. And what, you'll Wonderful. start speaking at what time? Oh, and you will all have, no, 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 it's, it's, you know, we've been doing a lot of reimagining in Burnsville. It's going to be a new state of the city. Awesome. And also include, you just come and experience. Video dance off. Maybe. Oh, there's going to be some entertainment. The dance off? Yeah. No, there's, a, and there's entertainment. Dance, yeah. Trying, trying okay. to outdance the mirror. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah. entertainment. So, uh, <laughs> Melanie, anything else? Uh, no, Madam Mayor. Okay, Michelle? So with that, I think Ryan and Jen, all good? We stand adjourned by acclamation. Thank you, everybody.